Hello, I'm Pam Hoffman, Everyday Spacer. And I'm Jeff Miller, 2049 Outfitters. At Everyday Spacer, we show regular folks how to personally and directly participate in space exploration, science, and astronomy. We're here on Friday nights at 9 p.m. Pacific Time, 12 midnight Eastern Time, and 3 p.m. on Saturday in Queensland, Australia. Unless that changed, we had a time change last week. I better check. Sorry about that. We're broadcasting live from Thousand Oaks, California. Thank you so much for joining us. Tonight's topic um, will be um, Pam discussing different types of telescopes. We'll be back in 6.8 seconds. There are two types of things that, that a telescope does, collect light and focus light. And you need to be able to aim the telescope somehow. <laughs> Pam, tell us about types of telescopes. So tonight I will talk about optical telescopes. These are the kind that most of us recognize and use. There are, these are instruments that work in the visible spectrum. Uh, perhaps we'll talk about the other types of telescopes in a future show, however. In general, there are a few things to think about involving different types of optical telescopes. Jeff alluded to them in the intro uh, in no particular order. Hi, Scott. Hey, glad you're here. Thanks for joining us. In no particular order, um, this uh, will, will be light moving through the device uh, and focusing of light as well as light gathering power also known as aperture fever some of you know what i'm talking about and the um what the telescope is mounted on or the mount and a way to find things with the telescope i found a great article from the antelope valley astronomy club i know that it's dated september 22nd much is still pertinent today though some things don't change much in this field you want to be quiet? Nope. <laughs> the other one. There you go. <laughs> For example, they might not be meeting at that time anymore. They do have some really great sources, though. And they cover more than just the types of telescopes. And they um, do have some very interesting things here. But I have some other um, materials to show you as well. So I would say go ahead and scan through that. We might have a, um, a link to it. Do we have? Yeah, there it is at the top. Thanks, Jeff. Yeah, let me get this onto the chat so that people have something that they yeah, can click. Yeah, sounds good. It's a nice little PDF I found that had some. I just wanted to give you a feel for how this looks and what the information um, is about. There are three basic types of optical telescopes. You may be familiar with at least one or more of these. Here is what they look like when you see them in operation, maybe even at a star party. So this one is a refracting telescope. Here you have a reflecting telescope. And this one is called a catadioptric telescope. Isn't that a great word? When you look through this refracting telescope, you're going to see lenses. The, len the light moves through the lenses. With a reflecting telescope, it has mirrors and the light bounces around inside the telescope. A catadioptric telescope uses mirrors and lenses to form the image. So the light paths move a little differently inside these devices. Here we have that refractor. The lines and the arrows represent the light coming into the refracting telescope. It passes this objective lens here on the right-hand side. It comes to a focus and then it goes to the eyepiece lens and then it hits your eye. So those are the basic parts of that. It's fairly simple and it hasn't really changed much in about 400 years. The reflector also brings in light. These lines represent that as well. It hits the mirror, however, and then bounces back to a secondary, which then comes to your eye. And you can see this little, little uh, oval here it represents. Yes, it represents a lens. It is the eyepiece lens. However, it's not basically part of the telescope. It's the eyepiece part of it. 
And with the catadioptric telescope, it kind of folds the light. Here the light comes in, it bounces here, and it goes back out the, middle, the, the back end of this. And here's just a prism, so it comes to your eye at an angle. You'll see this here, though. They call this the um, corrector plate, so that's where the, quote, lens comes into play. There are some great advantages to this, though. It's got a long focal length, but it's in a short tube. So you don't have to carry around such a, a, a long, you know, telescope, telescopic tube. It does have a couple of disadvantages, though. It's a narrower field, and it takes a, a lot longer to cool down. One of the one of the things that affect your view is the temperature. We're doing real basic stuff here tonight, though, so we're not going to dive into a whole lot of details. All right. That's yeah. Go ahead. Samantha says, "Is that a kind of dioptric?" Yes. We just yes, catadioptric. I think the word is in here somewhere. Uh, Sorry, at the top? No. No. I have it in my notes. Sorry. Uh, I think uh, I don't know. We'll have to go ahead and spell it in there for Samantha. And thanks for joining us. Yeah. Is that, did you spell it right? I think you spelled it right, Samantha. Awesome. Yes, I'm right, reading yeah. it off of the notes, and yes, you spelled it exactly right. Okay, so next you need a way to focus the light, and there's a whole system involving this. It includes the eyepieces and moving the eyepiece around. Uh, now, you'll notice with these particular, oh, I it, sorry. They have some kind of different openings, and it's kind of a whole technical discussion. Maybe we do that in a future show. Tell us what would be interesting to you, though. We really want to know what you want to hear. Uh, I want to go back to this chart here, though, because you kind of they kind of allude to it when you see these boxy boxy pieces kind of inside each other. That's the movement. It's going to move back and forth until you get to a focal point for your eye. Until the eye can see the object the most clear, it's going to see. Uh, hello, death by smothering. I'm a neurosurgeon, but I always loved studying space. Awesome. Neuroscience and space are the two greatest frontiers for humanity. I can't argue with that, man. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Very cool. All righty. So let's go back. Here's our oh, eyepieces. Anyway. Yeah. Oh, Samantha. Yep. She saw. Oh, it. you saw it spelled there. Well, you had good eyes. Good. Because I didn't see it. Thank you very much. And you spelled it right. It's it pretty much some of the harder words. They're spelled exactly the way they sound. I love that part. All right, so let's see, where are we? Uh, oh, we have next a an eyepiece that's on the telescope. So you can see how this fits into uh, an eyepiece uh, a holder, basically. And here's another view of that. And, and I really like this because I can show you the arrangement. And I believe it's a rack and pinion style but here is a focusing knob there's typically one on this side and one on the other side you kind of can see it over in here and what happens is this whole pipe here sort of slides in and out until you see the object the most clear what you're looking for is the most clear you can see the object hey dave welcome so he, Dave says, I've been using telescopes since 1958 Woo! and for the last 20 years selling scopes to the general public. Remember, the best telescope for you is the one that you the will use. The one using. that you will use. That is absolutely correct. Yep. All right. So I believe, let's see. And I have some more views of how people are using this. So they have their hand on the little knob here. And, and I don't yep. actually recommend having your hand on the eyepiece itself, though. Yeah, you if you're looking, you don't want to touch the telescope very much. If you're focusing, though, you kind of have to use the little knob here to get it into the right position so you can see. And then leave it alone, yeah. Okay, so David says, telescopes today are made to a price, not to not a quality. Although most scopes today are optically good, it's in the eyepieces and more... More importantly, your observing conditions. I can agree with that. Thanks, um, Dave. Get away from the light, he says. Yes. When, so, when selecting a scope, uh, okay, kind of cut off there, David. But um, we are we, very fortunate near us. There's a national park with the ocean 
to the south. So yep. we have a really good site. Yep. And oh, Anthony. Hi, Anthony. Hi, Anthony. Welcome. Always enjoy a refresher on telescopes. Great show as always. Thanks, Anthony. Oh, thank you very much. And I wanted to get real foundational, basic primer type stuff. Mm -hmm. And hi, Cliff. Welcome. Yep. Yeah, we might go in more in depth in certain things later, but we wanted to have one episode of here's everything. You know, here's the foundations. So. Yeah, there's pretty much no end to how deep dive you can do on practically everything. And I believe I have, okay, so here's a slightly different arrangement. You see that they don't have the focuser as part of what's, you know, happening in and out of the telescope, rather this knob on the side here. So there will be some variations when you look at telescopes. All right. So what this one represents is kind of the variety of types of, again, I think this is the rack and pinion style. And what I did is I pulled out this one to make it a little bit bigger so that you can see some of the parts of it. Here's like the plate that sits on the telescope and you have those uh, focusing knobs here. Again, it's sort of like an axle with wheels. And I believe this right here can put pressure on it so that it will, in fact, this one probably doesn't have gears. It probably has more like a, a piece of mm, something like silicon or rubber inside here to, to gain friction against this particular, uh, I don't even know what this is called, but this is where the, I, the IP sits in here and you focus it by moving this. The in and out thing? The, the for, yes, forward or backward into the eyepiece holder. Yeah, well, and one of the things about the the two focusing knobs is that they are attached to each other. So it yeah. seems counterintuitive that you would need two unless, you know, right-handed versus left-handed. But I found, that it's much smoother if I use both hands. Oh, that makes perfect sense. I mean, I have much finer control if I use both hands, so. That makes perfect sense. And you know what, a lot of it is preference. Like I will take my glasses off to look through a telescope, but not everybody does. So it's really test things out for yourself. What works better for you? But that's sort of a blown up version of those other ones. And uh, we're gonna go into light gathering power or aperture fever next. So these different diameters provide different amounts of light. We also say light bucket. And in this single image, this is what aperture fever kind of looks like. Because if this works well, wouldn't this be better? Or maybe this? Or how about this? <laughs> This, ladies and gentlemen, is aperture fever. Of course, the trouble is you end up with this. <laughs> so we'll talk about mounts next because you probably need a mount to put the telescope on. And I really love a couple of articles I found uh, about this because they kind of have a real nice basic breakdown. In this case, uh, they say a telescope mount has only two functions, to support and hold the telescope rock steady so you can observe and photograph objects without any movement. And the other thing is your telescope must be able to move smoothly. I will emphasize smoothly uh, in a, a controlled manner so you can guide the telescope and point it at what you wish to view. So basically there are two types as depicted here, the alt azimuth and the equatorial. The alt azimuth is somewhat easier to set up and use so, oh, rack and pinion, yeah. Yeah. Put, <laughs> yes. Put a little lube on the but, rack. But not on the, not against the, okay. Yeah. Uh, you Be careful where you put that. Then the equatorial, it, it tracks objects a bit better, but we're going to talk about that in a minute. And this article um, is really nice. You know, they, they talk about mounts and the kinds. I love this part, the two functions. That's why I read the whole thing. And then they kind of dive deep into it a little bit. I'm not going to go into it here, but I'm just going to show you what is available to you. They talk about the equatorial. This one's a um, altazimuth. And they don't always look the same, but they do have the same function. Equatorial. And then there's the uh, Dobsonian. I actually met John Dobson. That's kind of cool. Then the German equatorial. And that's very stable and very, uh, very well made fork mount. They, del they delve into all this stuff. So there's a lot of options here. Um, so while they describe five, right here it says five main 
telescope mount types, I would say there's still just two basic kinds, the altazimuth and the equatorial. Oh, Cliff, Facebook was playing up so missed a bit, but David was right, seen as most important. Yeah, the weather, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> and out here they'll go, oh, the seeing is so bad. And I'm like, but you can see, because I'm from Northern Ohio, and out there, you can never really see anything. Basically, kind of like um, the weather that Cliff's been having. That right Cliff's been having. Yeah. Sorry, man. Yeah. David, can I add one more thing? If you are a bloke, you will soon suffer from aperture fever. Yeah. Men always want a bigger one. Buy the next size up scope first. <laughs> <laughs> kind of like with a computer. You always buy <laughs> cars. Yeah. You always buy the one. <laughs> Um, the next size up because basically for computers, it lasts another couple of years for you. That makes perfect sense. All right. So there is another really nice article. And I just want to point out, it is a little more recent, I think, as well as from these great people at American Eclipse. Uh, I, I don't know too much about this article just yet, uh, but I, I think it looked really good and had some really great information for you. And uh, we'll try and get these links to everybody. I think we can um, add them to the comments on YouTube and also on Facebook. So I'll work on getting those to you. Yeah, they go into all kinds of different things here. And, and this is very detailed. Some of this stuff I'm just not going to talk about tonight. We can go into more details in another show. Wheelie bars. I want to see wheelie bars. <laughs> what I really liked about this, though, was they have kind of the, the main item here, a picture of it, and a list of pros as well as cons. Fork mounts, again, pros and cons. Dobsonian. I think the Dobsonians are great. It's pretty much point and shoot. Equatorial. And uh, I, have, I have a feeling that, you know, with the with the way their astrophotography is going now, they're basically taking short exposure pictures, and then they're stacking them using software. So I'm not completely convinced that, you know, we're going to have to worry as much about tracking with them out. All right. So let's see. Uh, a word about these go-to mounts. They, you know, I, I call them roboticoscopes and they seem pretty popular or maybe someone wants to just sell them to you. Um, if you're more interested in computers, have at it. If you'd rather look at things in the night sky, you might want to keep it simple. I'm like I said, I'm a really point and shoot, shoot kind of person. I want to set up and start looking and i've seen some really sad tales with people that oh the time changed and they cannot use their telescope anymore well so, not, not without hooking it up to a laptop which they didn't bring with them well yeah it was anyway there was an issue if you have a robotoscope tell me why i'm wrong change my mind so and and a go-to can run either an equatorial or an altazimuth um, but yeah, again, with the stacking, I don't know that we're, we're as concerned anymore about tracking the objects that we're looking at in the night sky. Oops, Samantha comes in with, I'm curious, does the tube serve any purpose besides supporting the lens and keeping out ambient light? That is an excellent question. And that's basically its job. Yep. Yep. Um, for example, if you lived somewhere very dark, could you just suspend some lenses at the appropriate focal length and see a clear image? Yes. You could. I would still have something around it. And, and you'll see, gosh, do I even have a picture of it? Um, because there was yeah, one. Oh, there that was. Show, yeah. Showed, the oh. uh, <laughs> finding it. Uh, well, that's sort of. Yeah. This, uh, where was it? It was the aperture fever set, wasn't it? No. Yes, here it comes. That uh, next one. Oh, yeah, here. No, this is good. Go ahead and, and share screen again. Is that actually open there? Okay. It's, I'll, I'll explain. Okay. All right. So, and go ahead and pull her. So, in the case of this particular beast, <laughs> right, it has a, a, a system of trusses. And what's what they've done is they've put this cloth over them. So that what happens is it breaks down. There's this barrel part here, the base, and all these pipes. Basically, they're just tubes, metal tubes. They also break down, and they can put it away. 
and it's a more open structure underneath that shroud, I believe is the word they call it, shroud. So you'll see more of an open structure like this. And yeah, if it's dark enough, I, I think it's still good to have this kind of a shroud over it though. Um, just so you, you don't get stray light bouncing around. It also keeps bugs out. It also provides protection against dew, um, moisture getting on the lens or, or mirror. So, and I, oh yeah, we got another question. Hi, yeah. Dave. Sorry to keep barging in. Nope. It's good. Yep. That's why we're here. But I live this stuff daily. Yep. yep. That's why it's good that you, you, um, join us on these. A few tips. If you are a newbie, avoid complications. A 90 millimeter refractor or six to eight inch daub are excellent starter scopes. Yep. Heck, I'd go to star parties and take a look at things. Yeah. You but, want to be respectful of people's equipment, certainly. You'll get a shot at looking at a whole bunch of different things, though, and you'll get a real feeling for what you like. Mm -hmm. uh, Did you have another? Yeah. If a refractor by oh if a refractor by an az scope okay and avoid pulling your hair out <laughs> okay oh michael hi michael hi michael welcome hello from hong kong all right so i do have a couple of pictures okay of these kind and that's the altazimuth it's uh this is a dobsonian and uh, did we run these? No, we didn't run these. Did okay. So here's the equatorial mount. And what you have to do is um, align this with the, um, and here's a picture of it right here. Oh, you're welcome, Samantha. Absolutely. Oh, good. Well, thank you. So you want to um, make this parallel to the rotation of the earth. I love this graphic. And it's dependent upon your latitude. So what happens is that this will be the, road, the the point at which this whole operation rotates around. Rotation of the Earth, rotation of the Mount. That that that's why that's why an alt azimuth is easier to set up. Yeah, because you definitely want to make this so that it's aligned with the axis of the Earth. Otherwise, it's kind of hard to hard to use. And you can see even the catadioptic can go on this type of amount. And you probably want a way to find things with your telescope. So you're probably going to want a, a finder scope or a tell rat or something similar. Hi, Cliff. Uh, most computer scopes are controlled by your phone and oh. do great astrophotography. Huh? Oh, that's cool. Well, thank you for telling me. I appreciate that. My, my experience with robotoscopes is about five to ten years old. So yeah. they weren't quite as... Yeah, they were a little bit clunkier back then. I think so, yeah. Um, and Samantha, I think there is a Dealey on the chat. Dealey? I don't know. Oh, delay. Oh, yes. delay. Yes. Um, there's about a 10-second delay at least, um, depending on where you are. Right. And I I think we just have to deal with it. Yep. Delay. Yeah, that's okay. All right. So here, this telescope has both a finder scope and a tell rad. I'm going to zoom in a little bit so we can look at it a little bit more. And it's kind of cool because you don't have to go far to look through for either one of them. Oh, this actually has a pretty good view of the tell rad. I brought a lot of pictures of the tell rad because it's not, it's not real obvious how this operates. So you see down in here, it, it's got a light that shines up onto this plate which you look at in this direction. So you, you put you, your face looks pretty much the same place. This one. So you put your head around here, you can look through there or down into the finder scope in this case. So the finder has a wider field of view than your telescope. And it has crosshairs when you look through it that help you center in on the object you're trying to find in the telescope. You should, align your telescope and your finder scope, uh, you know, beforehand, especially it's a little bit easier when it's, you know, in the daytime, it's light. So you can find something far off that's static and look through one and then the other, and then get them. So the crosshairs uh, are, are actually focused on one 
object that, you know, whatever you see in the middle of the telescope is also the thing you see at the crosshairs of the finder scope. And you'll notice there's actually a Telrad platform right here. It's just not on the telescope at this time. All right, so here's your basic Telrad and it's battery operated. So it's going to require, you know, some power, some charge. You want to maybe bring extra batteries and the, the target will be lit up. Remember we saw from down here, the light, it shines up on the plate and then you look at it in this direction. I think they got the moon in there, right in the center of the target. Polar alignment. Polar alignment, right. So this is kind of a detailed picture of it. See, they have a star that's not centered up here and then one that is centered. It's just a bullseye, it's a, it's a target. The three knobs here will help you align it. There's a quick release for it and on and off. Like I said, it needs batteries. So you wanna have maybe extras. You wanna definitely have power for it. And they actually talk about the eyepiece and the telescope focuser as well as a, as a regular finder. My guess is since there's no magnification on the Telrad, the Telrad will get you in the general area. The finder yes. scope lets you um, zero in on it so that then you can view it in the in the main telescope. Yeah, there, like, like you said, you know, you can actually see, um, you know, outside of the Telrad as well. So it's pretty much WYSIWYG. And you just, you, you get your object into the center of the bullseye and then if you've aligned it properly, you look through a telescope and that's what you see. All right. And so the Telrad is um, kind of a horizontal uh, operation, but there's also this thing here that kind of goes more vertical. And this one happens to be a Rigel. So my spotting scope doesn't have a finder uh, and I had to develop you know, a way to find things without one. Uh, so I kind of created a hack and, hey, maybe we could do a whole show on astronomy hacks someday. So that's my coverage for the uh, telescope. They're, they're just basics. I didn't want to go into too much detail. And like I said, remember just a few things to think about the way the light moves around in the telescope, the, the focusing of the light, light gathering power or aperture fever, and what the telescope is mounted on, and a way to find things with the telescope. Everything else, drilled down, technical details for another show. <laughs> yeah, I think in general, the refracting scopes are probably longer than the reflectors, not by a lot, but, but by some, they're also easier at the, at the wider, um, at the wider ranges. The the third one, catadioptric, yes. is basically like a reflector, except half as long because it's bouncing the light um, back and forth. Yeah. So it's a little bit more compact. We often say folding the light. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, Pam made a new video for her star party at your place, which we've been talking about for a little while. It's 54.5 seconds long. There Sorry. Go. Okay. And because of the delay, um, David came in a little bit later. Um, a great little trick I use is place my laser pointer beside the focuser base on my daub. Mm -hmm. When when pressed, the green beam will point almost exactly to where I want to see. 
yeah, you do want to be careful, especially if your country has any regulations regarding this. Like us. The, yeah, like here, uh, we, I think, I don't even think we can use certain ones anymore. And if there are airplanes around, you absolutely want to not. And you can't shine use them. them anywhere near a horizon. So, oh. you, so you're not allowed to point anywhere near the horizon. So straight up, pretty, pretty okay, because at the most, you'll light up the bottom of an airplane. Mm, but at okay. a horizon, you might be pointing in a windshield. Yeah, I knew it was pilots, but I didn't realize the horizon one. Of course, I probably heard it, but I don't yeah. remember. Yeah, and Cliff, I also use a laser attached to the scope to point out the spot the scope is, is looking at for bystanders. Oh, yeah. Yeah, no, that's a great way. And, and also sometimes if you, like with my little spotting scope, I do not do not have a finder for it. Well, I got a Rigel. It's mounting it. That's my problem now. But yeah, if I have light and I can find that, I can follow it with my scope that has no finder. So there's a lot of ways to use it, but. Yeah, maybe strap a laser pointer onto it. Yeah, and I haven't got one yet. I just don't know exactly what what kind of we're allowed to have, and I just haven't really messed with yeah. it. But it's yeah. it's a good plan. It's yeah. a good plan. And it just needs to be bright enough that it lights up the air. The yeah. In the air. Well, and there's dust. There's lots of dust in the air too. Yeah. Okay, some stellar events this week: March 18th through March 25th. March 20th, Mercury and Jupiter are in conjunction in the morning. And Venus is at, at its greatest western elongation, also in the morning. Also, March equinox um, fall begins in the southern hemisphere, and spring begins in the northern hemisphere. Um, March 23rd, weekly space hangout news roundup, which means that they oh, don't have a guest. And that's the one with me. Oh, I didn't that put is it. You. I didn't put in the notes. <laughs> Yeah, you didn't tell me. Okay. I'm one of the journalists, so I'll be doing some of the okay. news roundup part. So on the 23rd, it's about Pam. No, it's not. And um, Mercury and um, also on the 23rd, Mercury and Neptune are in conjunction, um, one of which you'll see. Um, also, Globe at Night, the Globe at Night project begins, the next one. Um, the project runs for 10 days from March 23rd through April 1st. Do we have a thing for that? Um, yes. We do. We're looking for Leo in the northern hemisphere right there. and Crux in, in the southern hemisphere. Um, March 25th, last quarter moon, and our Friday night show where I'll be talking about launching things. Um, we had a primer about different types of telescopes. I'm going to just do a primer about different ways of launching things off the Earth. Cool. Um, find us Fridays at 9 p.m. Pacific time on Everyday Spacer Facebook page and the Everyday Spacer YouTube channel. Awesome. Thanks, Jeff. And before I move on, I am going to, oh. that's what I just said. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, David. I know there's a delay. Sorry. Yeah. You probably said it about the same time. Yep. <laughs> All right. So there are some ongoing activities. The third opportunity for a nominated student with Perseverance opens March the 24th. This is for sixth through eighth grade students in the United States. Public, private, and home schools are included. This is three of four, and there are some pretty cool awards involved. Uh, you can fly your name around the moon. I checked earlier today because I've seen lots of pictures of the Artemis test flight, and it was still live. So try, try it out. Add your name to the Artemis 1 test flight of the Space Launch System rocket and the Orion spacecraft. There's the link. And uh, you might get to, uh, they might fly, fly your name too. And I guess it's a thumb drive, right? They're putting a thumb mm -hmm. drive on this one. And it'll go around the moon. ESA, build your web challenge. We've been talking about this one for a while. You can get creative. Build your own model of the James Webb Space Telescope using any materials you like. Then you submit your web challenge projects to the, ES, the ESA, European Space Agency, education team, and the selected projects will be displayed in a gallery on the ESA education website. This is for six through 19 year olds, school, home, wherever. We didn't see anything about location, so I think it's from anywhere in the world. And- uh, Yeah, one more comment <laughs> from Cliff. Yes, um, Pam, Pam dug out the photos that she had with you and David at the star party. <laughs> I had a little fun. Um, so, I think we're done with that one. Yep. So if you or someone you know has done something interesting involving space exploration, science, or astronomy, we'd love to share our live. 
Join us again next Friday, March 25th, for different ways of launching things off the earth. All right. Any last questions? We'll hang around just a second because I know there's a delay and I want to help you out. Of course, I'll hang around after too. And I, I don't know if you've noticed, but I do respond as well. All righty. Thanks so much for being here. Let's read off some names. Cliff and Samantha and David. David. And go ahead. Um, you can see them better. Michael. And Michael. And um, they're way up. Anthony. I remember um, seeing Scott. And Scott. Yep. And Scott. And Death by Smothering. I haven't seen you before here, so welcome. Welcome. And I think I that think we got everybody, right? We really appreciate you coming and watching our show. I hope you enjoyed this. If you have some particular topic you would like us to delve into and demonstrate whatever, we would love to help you out that way, too. All righty. Thanks so much. Have a great week. And we will see you next Friday. Good night. Good night.